and we're going to go to our GI fellow, Ann Robinson. She's going to present the case. Okay, thank you. Okay. Yeah, yeah. So our first case today will be a case of a large right sided sure. polyp. It's okay. a 74 year old woman with a family history of colon cancer. She was referred for a possible EMR of a 2.5 centimeter sessile serrated adenoma of the ascending colon. The colonoscopy was done on April 5th. Uh, it was significant for hemorrhoids, sigmoid diverticulosis, so two five millimeter sigmoid hyperplastic polyps, a five millimeter transverse colon tubular adenoma, and then a 25 millimeter polyp in the ascending colon. It was biopsied, um, showing it as a sessile serrated adenoma, um, and no tattoo was made. Great, thank you. I uh, will go to Ken and endoscopy image, please. Okay, we, we have your image, Ken, go ahead. Fantastic, all right, very quickly uh, about the equipment we're using. This is an adult colonoscope with near focus. And I have intubated to the cecum now, I'm in the cecum looking at the appendiceal orifice using water infusion, water exchange is the, what we call this. So the gas has been turned off the whole time. So there should be very little gas residual gas in the lumen. And as I went up to the cecum, I was doing water exchange. So I'm pulling out gas and replacing it with the water, saline. So we use saline, but we call it water. Um, and then we have, uh, let's see here, what else here? I have a cap, you can, you don't see that so well. And that's because of the zoom effect that we get. So this is the uh, uh, poor man's magnification that we get with the underwater view. So now I have near focus on, and you can see how nicely uh, we can see the mucosal architecture and vascular patterns. So this patient has an SSA, and I have found that the underwater technique is particularly useful in detecting these SSAs for two reasons. Firstly, you get that floating effect. So these SSAs that are often very flat become more prominent and more visible and the second is you can really see that mucus cap well. Often that, they're so stealthy that uh, if you can really clean out the lumen well, and we do that automatically when we're doing water exchange, if you see any mucus left, they will have to think about an SSA. So here's the AO, and this just illustrates how we're using the water jet function, which I'm um, infusing using my foot pedal here. So it's going through an accessory water jet <coughs> and when hey, I Ken, can you just talk like about why you use normal saline as opposed to uh, sterile water, please? This is, this is sterile water, that's correct. No, it's, it's saline. You, I thought I you said saline. you use saline. It's saline, the reason for right. saline. I used and to why, use why, why do you use saline yes. as opposed to Let me explain. H2O? Yes, so the reason is that the water for some reason, it triggers the mucosa to secrete a film of mucus. So it's not a problem if you're doing a quick procedure, but if you're in there for a longer period of time, uh, for example, here we were waiting a while, this would all be covered with sort of a thin film of mucus. That's why. Um, I don't think it makes a difference in terms of the electrocautery effect whether you're using saline, although in theory, an ionic media is going to transmit better. Now here, again, to show you, look, the IC valve is facing me. And that's what happens underwater. When we give gas, we actually push the IC valve away. So sometimes it becomes more challenging to intubate. So here, I can just hold the tip of the scope here and very slowly go into the terminal ileum. You can see how we can see the villi so beautifully. So it, and it's a torquing movement that you're doing when you use underwater, also for the intubation, you learn how to torque your scope and spin it around. So you can go really deep into the ileum using this technique. Um, and that's because you don't get looping. Look how far and how quickly I'm going in. So I'm not going to spend a lot of time, but I just want to illustrate how this is a very useful technique for getting deep intubation of the ileum. I am coming back, and also with uh, MBI, you can see I just love these views. 
I, you know, it, the underwater technique, what makes it for me um, uh, appealing is just the views. You know, this is like going snorkeling or scuba diving. So it's not just this, this magnification effect is 1.33 fold, but it's also you have no light or art, reflection artifact. You have no fogging. Um, you have you have a lot. You don't have the artifact that you often get when you use gas. And if you use cautery, you don't get any smoke effect. So these are all, I think, advantages of just being able to take advantage of the ability to use water submersion when you do these procedures. Now, as I come out, look at how beautifully we see the opening. It's just gaping in front of you like this. So this is the reason why I have been able to resect these icy valve lesions very uh, efficiently uh, and I think more easily using the underwater technique. Now, I don't want to spend too much time. I just want to show you how I interrogate the lumen. I use a global water exchange technique. The gas is turned off the whole time. Although I do selectively use gas, sometimes I need to. For example, when I make my diathermic markings around the lesion, I may need to flatten out the lesion a little bit. But I take advantage of the contractions here to look. This is how we, we don't get these accentuated folds you get with gas insufflation. So I can look behind. I'm, I'm basically going around 360 like this in a helical fashion and I'm using the water jet to interrogate the lumen. And you can also see the effect of the water jet on the mucosa. See how I can spread? Now look at this. Here's a lesion. I'm not even sure this, is the le this might be the lesion to resect, but here it is floating right in front of you. Let's take the near focus off. You go in, you see that lacy mucosal architecture. You see it, it, sometimes these are also combined on the left side. If you look at that, it has more of an adenomatous appearing, yeah. appearance. Yeah. And on the right, it has less of that adenomatous. Often these are hybrid lesions. Now with NBI, you, it, it, you get sort of that greenish, brighter hue to it. So you can see the perimeter so well. And just, if you pay gas now, this thing would flatten out to double its size almost. So now we're going to make some little dots around the lesion and diathermic markings. And we're going to use soft coag. So Jeannie is right next to me here. And in fact, now, rather than have his camera look at me the whole time, here's Jeannie. Uh, there she is. And Jeannie, I want you to give me the snare. We're going to use uh, 33 snare. So that's the largest snare that we have. And the camera now is going to show you what uh, my nurse is doing. And, uh, can and also, I have a second nurse who I'm going to recruit to hold the scope and position. I feel and that- Can you hear us? Uh, yes. Okay, great. Beautiful uh, demonstration. So uh, what's the plan now? You want to mark and then, uh, and then uh, 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 hot snare to resect the lesion? Yes. And let me just show you how, if you can keep me for a moment longer, this is very fast. And what's important is that the tip of the snare is flush with the tip of the catheter. See, there's a snare, and she pulls it in. You can look through the catheter a little bit, and you can use your catheter to move around like this. So all that it matters is that you are making your dots where the mucosa is normal. I'm also having my assistant give a little bit of water intermittently, which distends the lumen. Give a little bit of water. So I'm going to look very carefully and we're on NBI, so if it looks normal, I can buzz. See, there it is, the dot. And then we can just march around like this, just like this. Now, what we're doing ESD, so it's not like we have to have these dots all really close together or anything. It's just so that I know when I deploy my snare, I want an on-block resection. So I want to make sure that my snare is completely around the lesion. That's the only reason for the uh, dots. It's just to be sure. And then once I get my last dot, maybe here. So I think we got it. Now look how it's all nicely contracted, right? So now, so that contractility, this is what facilitates, open the snare. This is a big snare. Um, I just use this one. 
So we're good. I can take over the water. Thank you. Open the snare, please. So, uh, why you use a 33 millimeter though? snare if the, le the lesion is 15 millimeters? I'm sorry? Why use this big of a snare when the lesion is 15 millimeters? Is yeah, there a reason for that? I could use a smaller one. You're right. I just um, wanted to be on the For safe safety side, for the case. audience, uh, in the right colon, using doing hot, hot snare with a 33 millimeter uh, snare, do, uh, do you have any concerns? Well, here's what, no, yeah, you know, I could have used a smaller snare. 20, 25 would have worked as well. So, you know what, let's do this the right way. Give me a, let's, let's take a, give me a 25, all right? Because I tell you what, I always make sure that I get generous horizontal margins. And, I, and so I want to, my, my resections now are nearly all on block. I'm able to achieve that. And that, after all, is the advantage of ESD, that you pretty much, of course, by definition, are getting an on block specimen. And if we can accomplish the same with EMR, then I think <clears throat> that <throat> makes an argument and for ESD Ken, less when do you consider open? injecting under this lesion and what settings were you using to do your marking? Can you hold this, please? Let me just get this off because here I need to, I want to show you sort of the techniques. What we're trying to do is make sure that the perimeter of the snare is around these dots, all right? And there are two ways. What we want to do is displace that lesion up into the snare itself. So my assistant is holding this. And first of all, to and fro. Just push backwards and forwards and looking at how the tissue changes and how it changes the position. And then the second is torque and crimp like this, torque and crimp. And then the third is just a gentle suction. So just what I call the water pull. So I just pull it in a little, it's very gentle. If this were gas, it would immediately red out. So see how it just kind of pulls in like this? And then you can start to close, close. Okay, now I'm gonna look. So you can see, I'm looking just to make sure that I've got dots around. So I just rotate around like a rotisserie. Like this, just move it around, see if your dots, that dots a little bit on the outside, but I think it looks good. So now we're ready to take this off. I'm using pure auto cut, my settings, five effect, watts 50, and we're taking that off. Now we're off, now let's look. Now firstly, you'll note there's no bleeding. I'm always amazed that I rarely see any bleeding, and I think it's because the depth of resection is more superficial. It's not at the muscularis propria, which is very vascular, right? So you can see the edges and we can look and see, is there any residual here? I'm gonna biopsy this lower margin right there, just to be sure. So I get biopsies from the margins. I inspect it very carefully. Let's take the uh, NBI off and you can see we'll take the snare out. And then I'm gonna close this lesion, but first I'll get some biopsies. Now for these biopsies, you can do that underwater or you can do it with gas. In fact, I tell you what, let's just put the gas on now so we can see how it looks with gas. What's then the biopsy on? for? Okay, so now I'm giving gas. I'm giving uh, hey, Ken, are you able to hear us? <laughs> uh, yes, yes, sorry. Now Excellent. I can. Uh, no, no problem. What's, what is the purpose of biopsying the margins? You know, it's our protocol. It's our protocol. Um, and I can tell you that our endoscopic inspection with near focus underwater is so accurate. We, I have yet to find a lesion, hold the scope please. I have yet to find a lesion or a case where I did not, I, I said there's no residual and there was residual. So I find this to be very reliable, uh, but it's part of our, our prospective study protocol. Open. Any questions from the moderators? Yeah, Ken, do you ever find it necessary to inject under the lesion when you're doing um, a water submersion technique like this? I have not used injection since 2007. I never <laughs> injected since 2007, so that's how long it's dominated my practice. Um, so I, I don't know. I mean, we can talk a little bit about my, a big bias that I have open. I think if you can inject 
all, only around the lesion, it's, it, it would be acceptable to me. I have a problem injecting through the lesion. It just, would, it just doesn't make sense. Now you can see there's water, and this is the water gas interface, which is a pane. So let's just do this underwater view then close. It just takes time. That's why I do everything underwater. Just so I don't have to deal with the replacing the water with gas. And Deep, any questions? Uh, yes. Do you, uh, I was going to ask you, do you do this technique? Yes, I absolutely love this technique. The couple of things that help me fine tune my technique here. One, I notice that you have to turn the gas off. If you leave it on, you'll always get a few amount of bubbles. The second is you need to use an enormous amount of water. So this is a lot more water than just flushing the lesion. So you need to collapse the entire colon and really flood it with water. The third thing uh, I think is even if there's a little bit of stool debris in the colon, you need to clean that out because this beautiful visualization that you're seeing underwater is only possible if you have a pristine prep. And if you don't have a pristine prep, either don't do this technique or flush it, clean it out, and, and get all the stool debris. The, the only comment I had here was that I think at this point, we have good data to suggest that we should coagulate the edges of this lesion, either using the tip of your snare or an APC instead of a biopsy. And I was just curious, uh, can do you routinely do that? Because that's been our practice now is to, is to coagulate the edges of these large flat polyps, either using a snare tip or APC. No, I've never done it. Um, and our recurrence rate is under 5%, so I don't see a need to do that. Um, and I, as I mentioned, I think our inspection underwater with magnification, uh, near focus, uh, is so reliable. Uh, and as mentioned too, the dots I think are important, unless it's so obvious the lesion, polypoid, where you can really place your snare safely around the perimeter. And I think it has a lot to do with my approach of always attempting on block, although sometimes I will need to trim the edges. Now, just I do close all my lesions now, and that is since this amazing clip that's 22 millimeters in diameter has become available. So as you know, our clips have gotten longer and the prongs have gotten longer, allowing us to close larger defects. Now, what I don't like is when you have that bridge in the middle. I really would prefer to get a mucosa to mucosa adaption. So, you know, that would be if you had a suturing device here, uh, then you could throw one stitch there and pull it over and close it on this, this side. So now uh, can, we have uh, to one clips. question before we move to back to UCI. How big of a lesion you can resect on block using uh, underwater technique? Uh, on block, I, so we did a study, and uh, our on block success rate was uh, over 50% for lesions <laughs> 20 to 40 millimeters. So I would say basically four to five centimeters. Okay, great. Uh, Ken, beautiful uh, demonstration. We're going to see you uh, uh, put this clip here. Are you going to close it completely? Yes, I do that now. I close okay. these completely now. Uh, great. Uh, beautiful demonstration, Ken. Thank you, and we look forward to seeing your next case, okay? Thank you, Ken. Sounds good. All right. Thank you. And let's switch to UCI. Right. Ken, uh, you are on camera.